All right, we're launching. This is it, Saturday, July 20th, 2024, 12 noon Pacific. We're a little few minutes late. The Foundation for Restoration. Hello, Maria Kenny. Welcome. Set a spell. That's right, the Foundation for Restoration. And we're asking the question, is there a formula for history? That's a big, big topic, isn't it? Is there a formula for history? Tap that screen, share the live. Here we go. Bang. Now, if you want to see all my other lectures, go to the Principal Project of San Diego on YouTube and look for John Kenny. Oh, look, there's God. <laughs> we got him right here. Come on in, set a spell. Tap screen, share the live. Let's go. Tap the screen, share the live. Today, we're going to talk about the foundation for restoration in three biblical families, Adam, Noah, and Abraham. You would think, gee, that would be dry bones. It's not. Please trust me on this. It is not. And today, we're going to be talking about the Bible, this story from the Bible, from the Judeo-Christian tradition, of course. Why is... The Judea Ubermensch, welcome, my friend. Welcome. <laughs> Set a spell. Why is uh, Christianity getting, uh, Judeo Christian tradition getting singled out? Well, because it is the most influential religion on the entire planet. All of those countries are basically Judeo Christian, uh, with inroads going in, in throughout the Muslim world and into China and into India. Christianity is permeating the entire planet even in places where it's not generally accepted. Harmonize me. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> Thanks. But, yes, we're talking about the Judeo-Christian tradition, but, how it's a big but, isn't it? However, this is for everyone. I don't care if you're a believer, a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Confucianist, an atheist. It doesn't matter. You'll get something out of this. Everybody knows the, 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 the Old Testament stories of uh, Adam, Noah, and Abraham, etc. But you have never seen the formula for history laid out like you will see today. I guarantee you. Thanks for the likes, guys. Now, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. Here we go. This is Jimmy Fallon and Kevin Hart getting ready to go on a roller coaster. <laughs> oh, what fun. The Bible and new truth. We have to ask ourselves a very important question. I got to make sure my microphone is on and it is. All right. Is new truth being revealed? Many people tell you, oh no man, no, it's all been done. It's all closed. There's nothing, nothing left. I beg to differ and we're going to show you why we make that bold pronouncement. Jesus said something very interesting 2,000 years ago in the 16th chapter of John, the 12th and 13th verses. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. That's the first part. <laughs> I have many... I think we can infer from this that it could be that Jesus is withholding a body of knowledge. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How terribly interesting. He says, how be it, in other words, nonetheless, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. <laughs> That's pretty significant, if you ask me. Jesus is saying that there's going to come a time in the future when the body of knowledge that God is holding back will be revealed. He goes on. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, he will speak and will show you the things to come. Tap the screen, share the live. Oh my goodness, we haven't even, oh goodness, we haven't started. <laughs> In the same chapter, Jesus continues, boys and girls. These things have I spoken to you in Proverbs, but the time comes when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you, hello, plainly of the Father. I will show you plainly of the Father. Jesus is saying there's going to come a time when the mysteries are going away. The mysteries are going away. Rita Hope 
Rita Hokanson. Thanks for the likes. <laughs> now, the big question. Now, oh, by the way, so everybody knows, uh, TikTokers know, I'm uh, talking into a pad here. My TikTok live is on a Samsung Galaxy pad, a tab right here. Uh, and I'm going to be talking into a f camera too, because this whole presentation is going on YouTube in about an hour and a half, all right? And I'm going to try to respond to questions and comments here on a monitor uh, as I can, all right? I have a terrible signal anyway. Hello again. I'll try my best to hear most of it. Oh my goodness, is that, is that on your end, Ubermensch? Is that on your end? I've got 5G. Team, I'm right next to the towers, too. I got a rock solid 5G signal. Uh, hang on a second. Let me make sure of that. <laughs> yeah, I got a good signal. Let's get back in here. Are we, are we still okay? <laughs> I'm making sure I'm, I'm cool. Okay, here we go. Your end. Okay, got it. Okay, everybody's good. Excellent, excellent. Let's go. This is going to be fun, man. Now, we got to ask ourselves the questions. How do we know we're in that time? Jesus said there's going to come a time in the future when everything's going to be different. He's going to reveal everything. How do we know? Can we prove it? Yes, we can. Watch this. The Bible says knowledge shall increase. Number two. Many shall run to and fro. Eh, we're going to elaborate. And, uh-oh, there will be wars and rumors of wars. How do we know knowledge is going to increase? Well, we just look at the map here. Look at the timeline of history. From 2400 BC to all the way into the 1500s, basically not much happens, right? All of a sudden, the 1500s, the 1400s and 1500s hit. In the 1400s, you've got global exploration. The Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italians begin to to discover the entire planet and begin to develop the world, right? But invention starts happening. The telescope, the telephone, the computer, the TV, space travel, jets, boom, boom. Knowledge shall increase. It's, it's a prediction. Jesus saw it coming. Knowledge will increase. Number two, Many shall run to and fro. There's a thousand airplanes in the air at any given time, day and night. Trains, boats, cars, trucks. There's a thousand different ways to travel, right? Many shall run to and fro. And wars and TT, your T, oh, T-Mobile. <laughs> uh, wars and rumors of wars. Wow, how interesting. Well, it wasn't until 1914 that we could actually have world war, where the entire planet could cooperate at once in destroying each other, <laughs> right? World War I, World War II, Korea, 16 nations in Korea, Vietnam, the entire planet were involved in those conflicts. For the first time, world war was actually possible. So if any time qualifies for that time, it's this time, and we're gonna, we're gonna Take this on steroids here. TikTok. <laughs> oh, TikTok. All right. <laughs> I just turned 70 on July 4th. That's my excuse. <laughs> I'm a little slow. So Adam and Eve were in the ideal, right? In the Bible, we're going to, like I say, we're going to talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition. It starts out with Adam and Eve in the garden. Boom, the ideal. They have some kind of a fall of some sort, which you can see on my website, the Principal Project of San Diego. Look for John Kenny. And I explain this in excruciating and painful detail. Thank you very much. So, how do we know we're in that special time that Jesus talked about? How do we know? Well, from the fall to Moses is a 2,000 year period where Moses comes with the Ten Commandments. The scripture says in Genesis 6:6, 6, 6, the Lord God has said, I repent that I have created man. I have repent that I have made man. Even God was like, what did I do here? He was, God is broken hearted to see his, his creation so crazy and so destructive, right? But out of this comes Moses and the Ten Commandments. Finally, there's rails to run. There's some kind of order. Thou shalt, thou shalt not do this, don't do that. Ten Commandments. Five vertical between man and God. Five horizontal between people. Don't steal. Don't covet. Don't unalive. <laughs> right? On the horizontal side. Thou shalt not have any gods before me, etc., etc., etc. Right? <laughs> and we can fund World War. 
Well, yeah, that's a whole, that's another discussion, the, the Fed Reserve. Uberman says, it wasn't until the creation of the Federal Reserve that we can fund wars. Uh, there might be a kernel of truth to that. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 1912, wasn't it? Anyway, so here we go. Moses, the Ten Commandments, boom. 2,000 years later, Jesus comes with the Gospels, the New Testament. How very interesting. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Interesting. This whole period is leading up to Jesus. And Jesus is trying to bring the nation of Israel to the next step. He says, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, Jesus wants to bring the nation of Israel and the Jewish people to the next phase of God's providence. This tells us that God's revelation is ongoing upward and progressive from out of the fall to structure to Jesus and the gospel, the, the doctrine of true love, father-son relationship versus master-slave relationship in the Old Testament. Jesus is unceremoniously <coughs> unalived, shall we say, and by the way, pray about this, especially Christians, pray about this. Jesus did not come to die. Ask Jesus himself, Jesus, did you come to die? Or were you supposed to be embraced first by John the Baptist, then by the religious leaders, and then by the nation of Rome, and then the world? Think about that. Pray about that. Stew in that one. Jesus has to come back. He says, I have to return once again, which brings us to the completed testament age or the second coming of christ interesting three phases god's revelation is ongoing upward and progressive and it's very interesting seatbelts fastened think about this these are in 2000 year increments we already talked about knowledge will increase many shall run to and fro and wars and rumors of wars. We are in that time. Every 2,000 years, God unveils a new phase of his providence. We are at the year 2024. We're 24 years past when a new understanding should be emerging on the earth today. God is revealing new truth all over the planet at the same time. Like I say, you've just stumbled into the matrix. And I'm not kidding at all. Okay. So there we go. So why is this? If you take the word history, just for fun, this in 250 will get me on the bus. I know that. I get that. If you take the word history, divide it into two words. You get his story. Interesting. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a trivia point. I get that. But it, could it be that history, rather than being a series of disconnected random events, is actually contains a formula leading to an end. We're going to see that formula today. The driving force of history is God's effort to restore the kingdom of heaven on earth. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Tap the screen, share to live. <clears throat> oh boy. <laughs> so. Where shall we begin our quest? Even SpongeBob wants to know. Let's sally forth, I say. Search for the Holy Grail. Start at beginnings, Genesis 1:27. God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him. Male and female created he, them, plural, more than one. God is the harmonized being of original masculinity, original uh, femininity. Original positivity, original negativity, plus, minus, subject, object, up, down, east, west, north, south. The entire universe is polar. Complementary opposites. Because the creator himself is the harmonized being of complementary opposites. So, in Genesis 1.28, God doesn't waste a second. In the very next scripture, God tells them what to do. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. Then Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. If in fact this was true 6,000 biblical years ago, it's the same today. God wants us to be fruitful, multiply, 
have dominion. It only makes sense. I am the Lord of God, I change not. Well, these three blessings, you've never heard these explained, but we need to understand, if this is the first thing out of God's mouth, this must be really important. So we've got to talk about it. Yeah, what does it mean to be fruitful? What does it mean to be fruitful? Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. If with their mind and their body, they obey God's commandment to not eat the fruit, to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.17, God said unto the man, the day you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. Right? So, what God is hoping for his children are to unite their mind and body centered on the heart of God and become a perfected individual. Right? To become a perfected individual and demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Right? In the idea, this is the four position foundation, by the way. God does everything in the universe through this formula. God is the origin of masculine and feminine, plus and minus. God divides those two parts into subject and object parts. They, through the forces of give and take action, have relationship. And then a fourth position is, is made here. If you have a, a, a male lion, female lion, they have a cub. A uh, male dog, female dog, they have a puppy, right? Et cetera, et cetera. People have man, woman, boom, child, right? Four position foundation. You'll see that term and that diagram reproduced many, many times in, this, in these presentations. In the ideal, however, had Adam and Eve actually done this, they wouldn't have been long-suffering and they wouldn't have to be temperate. Temperance means not drinking alcohol or getting high, right? Long-suffering, they wouldn't be suffering. How, how can you suffer when you're experiencing the heart of God all the time, the love of God? You don't need drugs. You don't need uh, dis diversion. You don't need gambling. You don't need all kinds of weird things because you're already happy in the love of God, right? You're very welcome, Rita. Please stick with me. You're going to love this. I tell you, I keep telling people, seatbelts fast and thinking caps on. <laughs> we haven't even started. We haven't even, we are not even to the formulas yet. <laughs> but this is important foundational stuff to get, understand the nature of God, the heart of God. What does God want? What is God, what's the driving force of history? We need to know this. We need to understand this. Jesus said, he promised, this is coming. Clarity is coming, right? Unfortunately, I don't have my Bible here. Uh, Maria, can you get my Bible? It's, it's over there somewhere, I think. Or it might be in the uh, guest room. There's one Bible, right? But there's 400 different ways of understanding it. That doesn't make any sense. If it's the Word of God, it should be understood one way, right? It only makes sense. Thank you. Boom! One Bible. The Schofield, by the way, which is the best Bible ever made. Schofield reference. One Bible, but in Ireland... Catholics and Protestants fought each other for hundreds of years centered on that, that same book. Oh my goodness, it's crazy, right? So, clarity is everything. So now we have this first position is done. Fruitful. We got two more to go, right? Now we need to multiply. Once Adam and Eve have perfected themselves, then it only makes sense, right? Perfected man, perfected Adam, perfected Eve, What's the only thing they can possibly create? Show of hands. <laughs> Everybody have a Holy Ghost and live a sin-free life. That's right. <laughs> they can only have a perfected child. If Adam and Eve do indeed do this, become fruitful, in other words, mature. God is telling Adam and Eve, become mature and then multiply. They got them backwards. They multiplied before they were fruitful. That's the problem with the fall. Had nothing to do with an apple. The word apple doesn't even appear in the story. Uh-oh. So, Adam and Eve would have made the first true family and ultimately society, nation, and a perfected mankind. Right? It only makes logical sense. Once they've perfected themselves, then they perfect a family, and then that perfected mankind comes over here. This is really foundational to understand the formula of history because we have to understand what 
is God trying to do to begin with? What's God's real will? <laughs> we got to cut through all the fog and all the smoke and go, wow, there it is, right? So, if in fact they, per they create family, society, nation, and perfected mankind, then perfected mankind comes over here in relation to the creation, kingdom of heaven on earth. Everybody has everything they need. There's no unaliving. There's no stealing. There's no gambling. There's no addiction. There's no, none of the, the horrifying things that plague mankind now would never exist in this kind of world, right? But as it's written, eye is not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9. We've never seen it. You know, there's, there's near-death experiences, NDEs, right? People go flatline on an operating table. They tell the same story. They go into the spirit world. They go down a tunnel. They see their family, et cetera, et cetera. And they say they see colors they've never seen before. They hear sounds they've never heard before. There's a whole world that we've never been able to see because of the fall of man. Interesting. So this is... The three blessings explained, and this is very important because then you can understand the formula for history, God is trying to restore this, right? Bang. So, we will uh, very quickly, I want to just scan through the fall of man. What happened to the ideal? And then we'll go into the formulas, okay? So, who are the characters in the fall of man? we got a Garden of Eden. We have Adam. We have Eve. We have a serpent of some sort. We have a tree of life, we have a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there is some kind of a fruit on this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says to Adam, Genesis 2.17, and God said unto the man, do not eat of the fruit, for in the day you, you eat of it, you will surely die. That, that commandment is specifically enunciated in the scripture, and it figures in large in the story. And the reason is, I'll cut through a lot of stuff, an hour-long lecture, and tell you, God knows the possibility that Lucifer and Eve can have an illicit re relationship of some sort, some kind of uh, uh, relationship of temptation. But Adam is ultimately responsible. Adam can stop it. Even if, Adam, if, if Eve and Lucifer fall, Adam can be the Messiah to them, and they can come back to God through Adam. The Bible talks about Christ being the last Adam, okay? As long as Adam stays intact, Eve and Lucifer can come back through him. God would make a way of restoration, but he fell. He couldn't resist the temptation, and he fell as well. The tree of life is actually Adam. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is Eve. There's symbolic metaphors for Adam and Eve. Lucifer is the archangel, Lucifer. The serpent is actually Lucifer, the archangel, and Genesis 12, 9 says, he was thrown down from heaven and his angels. It assigns gender as well. He's a masculine angel and is thrown down from heaven and was renamed from Lucifer to Satan once he's, he falls away from God. And they're, ex they're expelled from the Garden of Eden. Top screen, share alive. Okay. Lessons learned from the fall of man. The tree of life. What's the tree of life? The tree of life is actually Adam. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is Eve. The serpent, does he look like this? Oh, oh yeah. C.S. Lewis said the biggest trick of Satan was to get people that he doesn't exist. This is the best way to do it. People think that the devil looks like this. Nobody believes this in their right mind. No. He probably looks about like this. <laughs> Handsome, silver-tongued devil. Oh, yes. It says he was the most subtle beast of the field. Lucifer and Satan are not so terribly obvious. <laughs> They're really slick, right? So the serpent is actually Lucifer, the angel of light in Revelation 12, 9. Boom. And the fruit. Is it an apple? Listen, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. The apple isn't mentioned in the story. There is no apple. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 11, not that which goes into the man's mouth defiles a man, that which comes out, this defiles a man. In the Genesis story, God said he created everything and it was what? Somebody, God created everything and it was what? Somebody type it. 
everything was good. There couldn't have been a fruit there that would corrupt them. There's no way. Everything was created good, so it's something else. I'll cut to the chase. It's not an apple. It was, oh my goodness, an illicit sexual union. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's right. Lucifer seduced Eve sexually. Eve seduced Adam sexually. They got multiply and be fruitful confused. They were supposed to be fruitful first, then multiply, then have dominion. They multiplied before they became fruitful. Oh, I said it. I told you. Tap the screen, share it alive. I'm not kidding. You're going, you just hit the matrix. You just hit the matrix, and I'm not kidding. Oh, there they go. They're done. Three blessings. The three blessings. Now, how could this happen? How come God didn't have more control? Adam and Eve, even though they're in the garden, they still have to grow spiritually. They still have to grow through three stages of growth. That's why God gives them a commandment. Don't eat the fruit. While they're in this stage of growth, they have to have, they're in the indirect dominion of God. God does not control them directly. They have to use their mind, their heart, Obey the commandment. Be careful. Don't do what God told them not to do it because they're in the indirect dominion. When you have children growing up, what do you do? How do you baby-proof your house? You put cover plugs in your electric sockets because kids love to run around with a knife and <laughs> stick them in, in the electric sockets, right? They do really crazy stuff and they hurt themselves. So you baby-proof your house, right? God is doing somewhat the same thing. They've got to have something to protect them while they're growing. Once they do grow through this stage, they obey that commandment, they continue their growth, and then they fulfill the purpose of creation. They become fruitful. They multiply. They have dominion. Then they make a family centered on God. Right, Rita? Ha-ha! <laughs> yes, it's correct. Shared alive. Oh, my goodness. We're not even starting. We haven't even got to the formulas yet. Only when they've grown through this three stages of growth can they have their physical relationship. They had this relationship here. That's why they fell away. What's the evidence? What's the, oh, that's an idle boast, Mr. Kenny. Oh, really? What's the fruit of that relationship? Their firstborn children, one unalive the other. Cain unalives Abel with, we don't know what, it doesn't say, it says Cain rose up and slew his brother. It could have been a tree branch, it could have been a rock, he could have choked, who knows, we, we don't know, the Bible's not clear about that. But this shows you there was something fundamentally wrong with the relationship between Adam and Eve that would result in their kids being this way. Imagine, if Adam and Eve would have grown to perfection, not eaten the fruit, do you think their kids could have possibly done this? No way, Jose. No way, Jose. They have free will. Free will is real, ladies and gentlemen. The God of the universe stops right at the door of your free will. The God that called worlds into being stops at the door of your free will. If I want, I could go out and rob a bank right now if I want. God's not going to stop me. I could do something really terrible. God will not stop me. God won't stop you. You are a free moral agent. You have to decide to do good. You have to decide to do what's right. Free will. Very briefly on free will. Fallen mankind. Here we are. That's me and you. Right? God's will hits fallen mankind. Our, hits our free will. Bang. If we fulfill that will, like in Deuteronomy 28, God says to the nation of Israel, I will bless you beyond your wildest imagination. It continues, though, in the 15th verse, but it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto my voice, all these curses will come upon you. Free will. Seatbelts fastened for this one. You ready? Everybody, open your mind, open your heart, get ready. Here it comes. God knows all the possible choices we might make and is prepared for each and every one. But our choices are not predetermined. No. The God of the universe relies on you to do the right thing. It's a heavy concept, everybody. The God of the universe stops at the door of your free will. But God knows the entire 360-degree panorama of everything you can do. 
and this way too. It makes a sphere. <laughs> 360 degrees this way, 360 degrees that way. <laughs> right? Top screen, share live. Boom. So, now we're going to get into formula. Okay, a little bit of background about the nature of God, what God's trying to do. Just how does God begin the difficult process of restoring the fall of man? How does God do this? this the, the world is just a mess, right? So how does God begin that process? God said to the man, don't eat the fruit, because in the day you eat of it, you will surely unalive. <laughs> okay? Boom. So here's Adam. Here's Adam. After the fall, Adam is a divided being. He's divided. His spirit is divided. He's created by God, but he's compromised by Satan. He's compromised by Satan, right? He has a blood lineage now. Now he has a blood lineage. Half of his blood lineage is from Lucifer, and half of his blood lineage is from God. But he's a divided being. God has to deal with a divided being. Now, the relationship between Lucifer and Eve this is the spiritual fall. Remember, Lucifer is strictly a spiritual being. He doesn't have a physical body. Eve has a spirit and a body. Lucifer seduces her spiritual body. Eve's motive is more unrighteous. It's further away from God's principle. Right? Eve's motive is more unrighteous. The principle status is farther from the principle of God. God never intended Lucifer and Eve to have any kind of illicit relationship of any sort whatsoever. Lucifer is a servant. Eve is his daughter. Hello. Adam is God's son. Genesis 2-7, God created man from the dust of the ground, a biogenesis, and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Now, God doesn't have just servants. God has actual lineal children, okay? I was not. This, is, this teaching is the, called the divine principle. And it is the new revelation from God on the heels of the Judeo-Christian tradition. This is the final chapter. I'll talk about, I may talk about that more later. Now, the relationship, the physical relationship between Eve and Adam now is less unrighteous and closer. To, they're going to have that relationship anyway, right? They're going to have that relationship anyway. They're, they're intended as husband and wife. They're brother and sister growing up. Sorry. Ha <laughs> ha. Thinking caps on. They are brother and sister actually growing up, growing in their, in their spiritual maturity until God tells them, now you can have children. They don't decide to have children on their own. They need to consult with their father first. They need to ask God, can, are we ready to have children? God will look at his watch and go, eh, let's give you another six months. Cook for another six months and come back and see me. Six months later, Adam and Eve come back. Can we make a family, Heavenly Father? Okay. All right, you two. <laughs> Give me some grandkids. All right. So this lays out the course of motivation, what actually happened. The relationship between Lucifer and Eve is further away from the principle. She's not supposed to have that kind of relationship with Lucifer to begin with. And Eve and Adam, this is less unrighteous because they're going to be husband and wife anyway. They made that relationship too soon. That was the problem. But it's closer to the principle and a little more forgivable. Heavenly tradition, the elder son inherits his father's foundation. The archangel realized the non-principle world ahead of God's sovereignty through fallen people. So he intended to take the position from the elder through Cain. Lucifer is jealous of Adam and Eve. The whole fall of man is Lucifer's jealousy of Adam and Eve because he's been with God we don't know how long. Could have been billions of years. We just don't know. But suddenly God says, I want children now. I love my servants, my assistants, the angelic realm, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, and all those angels. But now I want something special. I want a son and daughter. See? That relationship is very, very different. So, somehow, God must begin the restoration process. How is God going to do this? Again, Adam is now a divided being, right? God is Adam is compromised, right? He's born of God, but he's compromised by Satan. What to do? 
God has to begin a division process to bring about the restoration of the fall of man. So, what happens? God divides Adam into Cain and Abel. God, the two sons of Adam, first and second born, represent, Cain represents the first, and most scholars agree that Cain represents the first relationship between Lucifer and Eve. Abel represents the second relationship between Adam and Eve, right? But how? What to do? Cain represents the first fallen relationship. So, what has to happen now, Abel has to win over Cain, and God comes to Cain, interestingly enough. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. How interesting. God leaves the responsibility to Cain to master it. The same way God left the responsibility with Adam. If you don't eat the fruit, you'll do just fine. This is being reproduced now in the first generation of Adam and Eve. These guys have to restore the fall. They have to restore the fall between Lucifer and ultimately Lucifer and Adam. So Abel has to win over Cain. Cain has to come under Abel and make unity between first and second born. These positions have been reversed. Lucifer took the firstborn position. So now the firstborn position is in trouble. The firstborn position has to be restored, but it can't be taken. It has to be willingly conceded. Formula for restoration? Hmm. Formula for restoration. Thanks for the likes, guys. So, the formula for restoration consists of two things, two very important points. Number one, we need a foundation of faith. What is the foundation of faith? It is a vertical foundation between man and God. What was lost at the fall? The vertical relationship with God. We lost the word. God told Adam, don't eat the fruit. So we lost belief in the word. So we lost the word of God. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Vertical foundation. Then you need the foundation of substance. This is the actual formula for history. This is going to blow your mind. The found what is the foundation of substance? The foundation of substance is the horizontal foundation between first and second born. Matthew 22. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Interesting. Remember the first five are vertical, second five are horizontal, right? Once you have these two in place, the foundation, vertical foundation of faith and the horizontal foundation of substance, you have something called the foundation to receive the Messiah. We have to ask ourselves the question, why didn't the Messiah come sooner? Good question. Because the foundation to receive the Messiah was never laid successfully until Jacob and Esau. That was the first time that the foundation of substance was actually laid. Jacob is renamed Israel and Jesus Christ comes from that lineage. Yeah. So, what is required to make a foundation of faith? You need three items, three things. You need a central person. Someone's got to actually tangibly do something to restore the foundation of faith. There has to be a required offering. What was lost at the fall of man? The relationship with God was lost. We have to bring some kind of substantial offering of faith. Demonstrate faith and time. Time itself was lost at the fall. Time itself was lost at the fall. Hot in San Diego today. Again, our vertical foundation, that foundation of faith consists of these three elements. Then we need a foundation of substance. A foundation of substance. First and second born restoration has to take place. Brothers have to be reunited right and proper position has to be restored elder son inherits right lucifer took the elder son position he has to voluntarily give it up 
to the firstborn. When these two happen, you have the foundation to receive the Messiah. Only then can the Messiah actually come. When vertical and horizontal are restored, you can... <laughs> I choose spirituality and meditation over religious slavery written by the governments of the past. Very good. <laughs> so, how does this formula play out and manifest in the Bible? Now, I'm going to... I'm going to run... I'm going to try to run through this somewhat quickly. It's very complex, uh, and it takes a long time to explain. I didn't want to go this long to begin with, but I'm going to go... I'll demonstrate with a couple of uh, examples so you can see this formula actually playing out in the scripture. Adam's family. So, we need a foundation of faith. We need a central person, required offering, and a time period to restore this false situation. We need a foundation of substance. The archangel and Adam have to be... The archangel must come through Adam back to God. Firstborn must come back through secondborn back to God. Foundation to receive the Messiah. How does this happen in Adam's family? Well, we have the first sons of Adam and Eve are Cain and Abel. God asked them to bring a sacrifice. We, we, we've never understood why did God, number one, why did God require sacrifices? Number two, why did Cain unalive Abel? So our first foundation of faith, we're going to make some kind of a foundation here. Abel's going to make an offering. The required offering is a lamb. He's a, he's a shepherd and a time period, the time of the offering. However long it takes, we restore time. Boom, he does it, great. He makes his offering, all right. He makes his offering successfully, right? He makes his offering successfully. So we have a foundation of faith now. Some, someone has demonstrated faith, now we need the foundation of substance, the horizontal. We have to restore the relationship between first and second born. Here we go. So Abel has made a successful foundation of faith. Now, he has to reach out for the foundation of substance to Cain and win him over. And Cain has to come and submit and obey. But what happens? We need a foundation of substance. We need Cain and Abel to unite. Cain must come through Abel to come back to God. So they both make their offerings. Right? But what happens? No. Cain unalives Abel and the foundation is lost. The foundation is lost. They could not make the foundation of substance. God comes to Cain and says, well, why is your countenance rough? If you do well, you'll be accepted. Like God's trying to like nudge him. Like God can't force him to do anything, but he's like, he's questioning him. Like, do you really want to do this? I mean, if you do the right thing, every, God's it's like, the, like the Wizard of Oz. is like working the handles. <laughs> Come on, Cain, do it right. All right? But no, he doesn't. He kills, his, he unalives his brother. The foundation of substance is lost. The foundation of faith was made, but the foundation of substance is lost. The foundation to receive the Messiah is lost. So this first attempt to restore the fall fails. Now it's got to come down to Noah's family. Now this problem comes down 1,600 years and 10 generations to Noah, Noah's family, all right? Grain offering versus animal offering. Well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of God not thrilled with his offering. God didn't even care about the offering. God was after the artistic restoration of the relationship between Cain and Abel. Cain has to overcome his anger. Abel's the younger brother. You would think... Cain, being the older brother, probably made a much better offering, but that wasn't what God was looking for. God wants unity. See, rather than Cain unaliving Abel, Cain should have come to Abel and asked him, wait a minute, you know, we both know my offering was better. How come God accepted yours and didn't accept mine? If he would have been even engaged him in conversation, Abel might have been able to say, well, I don't know, Cain, I don't get it. I know yours was better. What? Let's do one together. Imagine if, if, if Abel and Cain would have made an offering together, God would have easily accepted that. Ah, oh, my, my grandchildren have united together, and then they offer an offering together, but that didn't happen. And it could be that Abel was arrogant. I think the story, it doesn't say this, but I think the more likely scenario was Abel was like, 
you see that offering, bro? <laughs> pretty good, huh? Yeah, pretty hot offering, huh? Yeah, you'd be mad too. <laughs> that's, that's probably closer to the truth, what happened. Abel rubbed it in his face, right? Yeah. Oh, this, there's no confusion. This is, really, this is really clear stuff. Now, we come to Noah's family. The formula is going to reproduce again. We need a foundation of faith. Required person, required offering, time period. Archangel has to come through Adam back to God. Foundation to receive the Messiah. Who's the central person this time? Noah. What's the required offering? The ark. What's the time period? 120 years. The formula is real, ladies and gentlemen. The formula is real. It's a real formula. What does he do? He does it. He builds the ark. Success. We have our foundation of faith established. Now we need what? Foundation of substance. Foundation of substance. Brothers have to unite. Elder and younger have to unite. What happens? Ham sees his father, Noah. Noah began to be a husband, planted a vineyard. Basically, Noah drinks some wine. He's in the tent. He's naked and drunk. Ham sees this and out of shame gets his brothers and they walk in backwards with a blanket and throw it on their father in shame. Noah awakes from his wine and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brother. In other words, it was completely wrong to do that. Completely wrong. Ham's sin was he was ashamed. Like Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed in the garden, he, he is seeing his father naked and he's ashamed of him. Displeased and stirred up resentment among his brothers. Noah just got done working for 120 years and saved his family from death by building the ark and saving his, the eight members of his family and all the animals, and yet he has the time to be embarrassed by his father. That's why Noah wakes and, and condemns him to slavery. Cursed to be Canaan, a slave of slaves that would be. Adam and Eve were naked and, ash and ashamed in the, in the fall, right? And they covered their lower parts. Same thing here, Noah and Ham. Ham is ashamed, ashamed of Noah's nakedness and throws a blanket on him. A condition to reverse the content of the fall failed. So the foundation of faith failed. Yeah, it's, it, this is too long. It's, it, it, this, will, this will go for an hour and a half. So the second attempt to create the foundation to receive the Messiah fails. All right? Shem and Ham, this fails. Foundation of faith, foundation of substance is lost, foundation to receive the Messiah. Boom. Now it comes down again to Abraham's family, foundation of faith, foundation of substance, five animal offering. He's got to offer some animals on, a, on, a, uh, on an altar, but he didn't cut the birds. He had he cut several animals, failed to cut the birds. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, a great horror of darkness fell upon him. He realized, oh my gosh, I didn't cut the birds. And God says, you'll be a, a, a sojourner in a land not yours for 400 years. And then the Jews went into Egypt in slavery for 400 years. Birds of prey descended on the offering. Boom. The first attempt to create a foundation to receive the Messiah fails. But then finally, Abraham makes another offer. God says, now the offering is much harder. Now he says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. The one I told you, you you'd be the father of many nations through him. God asks him to sacrifice his son. Remember, he raises the knife. The angel stays his hand and says, don't hurt the, hurt the boy. I just was testing your faith. And then together, Isaac and Abraham sacrifice a ram and the foundation of faith is, is restored. For the first time now, we have a foundation of faith and substance. So the long and short of it is, finally, I'm going to go down to Jacob's victory. This is why the Bible talks about, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because it's not until Jacob and Esau make unity together 
that finally we have a foundation to receive the Messiah. Jacob wrestles the angel at the fort of Jabbok and is renamed Israel. And from Jacob comes Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Again, this is why the Bible talks about I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It takes three generations to finally get this foundation to receive the Messiah. A successful foundation. Then 2,000 years elapses, Jesus comes. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because finally only one family finally got this formula right. So remember, we're in a very, very special time. Very special time. 2024, every 2,000 years, God reveals something brand new. Every 2,000 years, and now we're in that time. That teaching is the divine principle. Uh, also, so you know, if you want to see my other presentations, go right here. YouTube, the principal project of San Diego. <clears throat> All my other presentations are up there. This will go up in, in a little while, probably about an hour. I'll put this presentation up on uh, YouTube. And for right now, I will close the camera and I'll talk to the TikTokers.